Thanks, Brett, for the introduction, and my thanks to uh, Kim and Jacob uh, for doing their parts. And I uh, was asked to do a little uh, demo on acrylic or on spray paint spritz painting. And this is a method that uh, kind of grew out of camouflage painting that I've done over the years with just regular artist acrylics, uh, where I would use a brush to stipple a, uh, a layered, uh, layered paint layer that would give a neutral tone that would have kind of elements of the various colors in the object. Um, <clears throat> when I started in mount making at Seattle Art Museum, uh, we did everything just black and would only paint out just the most obvious parts of grabbers and things like that. Um, as I then progressed through, I did the, the stipple with the acrylics and I then went and worked at the museums in Santa Fe, New Mexico as one of the preparators there. And they would tend to use Krylon spray paint in the same way where we'd set down a base layer and then you'd do a light dusting of other ones and then little spritz accents to bring up certain colorations and you do it within the color uh, palette of the object. Um, when I came back here to Seattle and started working on my own again, I didn't really want to invest in the Krylon paints partly because of the, uh, the toxicity, um, they're a regular high solvent, uh, high VOC paint. Um, they're very good. They'll pass, I think, most entirely pass Adi test. The clear Krylon is actually, I think, a B72 uh, spray formulation. In any case, I was at an art supply store one day and I found the Liquitex spray acrylics. And the thing I really liked about them, apart from the fact that they're water-based, there was a huge array of uh, of colors and um, uh, but the thing that was so nice was they were colors I knew so you know this is yellow oxide and bronze yellow and you know burnt sienna and the things that I was used to working with in my uh, my acrylic palette because most of my work was on natural materials, was uh, native uh, objects or uh, uh, natural history. And so these colors worked very well with it. Uh, and the spritz technique gives you that ability to come into the color palette of uh, each of the various uh, objects pretty darn easily. Um, the, uh, these dry fairly quickly. You can overcoat, I, you can spritz them while they're still wet and they'll start to actually bleed, blend. Or you can do it where you let them dry and come back and overcoat and get a little more depth to your, uh, your coating. Um, the surface character is a fairly matte surface. Uh, it doesn't really have a gloss to it. And I like that because it doesn't pick up a lot of light when the object is lit. And so it's a fairly quiet visual sort of uh, thing. And in uh, kind of the philosophy of painting out mounts, I fall on the side of I want people to understand that the mount is a mount and it's not a piece of the object. But from there, I want it to not draw your attention. I don't want you to have any reason to look at the mount. I want you to look at the object. And this sort of thing has done pretty well. Now it's kind of interesting, we've just been testing things out today and realized that one of the drawbacks of these paints is that they seem to have a bit of a shelf life. And so with the pandemic and everything, these paints have been sitting on the shelves for a couple of years. 
and there's a number of them, colors that I'd really like to have today, that just are dead. They are not moving. Others, when we finally got them to flow, extruded a almost like a caulking, and that was you know the, the paint that was in the pickup tube. But they cleared, and so we're going to try it with these, but um, be advised that if you're not using them, these paints may not last as well as something like a Krylon. The other thing about them that I found out very quickly was that the nozzles that they come with are really not very good. And so uh, the first batch I got, I took back to the art supply company I got them with, intending to return them, and he said, it's the nozzles. Here, have an entire handful of these nozzles and you'll find that they're much better. And so he gave me this group of green nozzles that are, they're different colors green and they have different uh, spreads to their different patterns uh, to their spray. And those have been really nice and they've lasted well. As soon as you're done spraying with it, you want to invert it, clear it, and then pull it off and throw it in water. And that's the beautiful thing. It's all water-based uh, for cleanup. This is a totally different sort of nozzle that I got from Stuart McDonald Manufacturing, who's the in musical instrument uh, supply company. And this is for their spray lacquers. And the yellow thing on there, that can turn this way. And so this gives a flat pattern that you can run at whatever angle you want. Um, so we're trying that with the, the Liquitex. I'm a little concerned that it is a more viscous paint, and so it may not work as well, but so far it's worked okay. So we're going to come over here, and this is the other reason I like the Liquitex, is because I don't have a spray booth. So I've set up with my... Uh, soldering table evacuation system, I've set up just a very small capture area to keep the overspray contained. And I'm going to turn on the fan, and since this is not a flammable paint, I don't worry about any spark or anything like that, where as this is not necessarily an evacuation system I'd want to use with a paint like Krylon. So I've put a base coat onto these mounts, and uh, it's good to use an actual primer, especially on a steel mount. And this is, this is steel, this one is brass, so you can use it on either one. I can see that I didn't get any underneath on that in my top coating. Um, but now we're going to go and we're going to paint each one, so I, I put on a, a base coat of a, a gray, and now I'm going to move into color, and I'm going to start with keeping fairly far back uh, with my pan and letting it be a very light uh, mist coming across the mouth. And the So I'm still letting a little bit of the gray come through on that. And this one I'm gonna do even. And so there, I've, I've now gone and I've got the background of the gray with a little bit of, this is a burnt sienna. And I'm going to go ahead and just for the, the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to continue to move fairly quickly on this. And I'm not going to paint the two different ones just a little bit uh, different in terms of which is for which object. See? I'm getting a real spatter from this can. That, that can decided it does not want to work well. <laughs> Oh well, so we'll try with a little yellow oxide instead. Boy, there. Yeah, 
these are being a bit of a problem today. Um, here we go. <laughs> With new paint, this would be a much easier thing, but it is um, <laughs> being a little less than perfect. I'm hoping that you're getting, though, the gist of the process and will experiment yourselves. Yeah, these. All right. So, as you can see, this is a bit of an art. Um, your materials do make a difference. Um, we're not having the best luck with the Liquitex, and that may be a uh, you know a warning. Uh, we have used over the years Krylon, uh, other spray paints that come in relatively good on our Audi test uh, sort of safety for objects. Um, on all of these, I would be painting the one side and the other side would be my padding. And so I would either have masked that or would be, you know, having it firmly enough painted to be able to put the padding on it. But you can see that even though I haven't been able to get it as dense as I, I would like to, the spatter painting technique gives you a depth of, uh, uh, of finish and color. And you can shade it in a lot of different ways. Uh, and in the end, yeah, that's not, not the way that was supposed to end up, but what I'm trying to do is emulate that sort of a, a finish in the end. So thanks for bearing with us on this, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop. It's nice to be back after our little uh, session on spritz spray painting and we've had a slight thought on that these liquitex uh, spray paints were on an outside wall of an old industrial building and we had very cold temperatures here this uh, winter so these paints may have frozen which may have been one of the reasons we had so many issues with them all right now we're going to talk about chemical patinas and chemical patinas is a system of coloring my mounts that I've been using quite a lot for many years. I like it because it's fast and it's convenient and I can, can work with it uh, very easily. So here, this mount is a brass mount with a uh, Birchwood Casey M38 patina. And this is my major patina and this is a antiquing patina and it's not exactly the color that is the object, but it's a very harmonious sort of color. And in the end, building the mountain this way, it's in the visual shadow and it works just fine. Here is a piece of steel that was patinaed probably four or five years ago with a black patina and it shows off the surface character. It's got a really nice matte finish. This is probably protected by a little bit of Renaissance wax, and uh, but uh, it's just a really great kind of wabi-sabi sort of a look, and I really like it. Um, so I work with patinas from a company called Sculpt Nouveau, 
and my main one is their Birchwood Antique Brown M38, and this can be dipped or sprayed. I use it in a dipping form, and so I go and I took that quart and actually cut it by half because it works just as well, but I like to slow it down a little bit. Uh, the first times I used it, it was extremely fast in its uh, action. All right, so now I'm gonna just show how pretty much straightforward using the M38 is. So I, I go and I dip with it and uh, I usually have a little tweezer um, or something, but I'm just going to use my hands and I'll, I'll agitate this a little bit, move it around. And the, the whole reason that I go and uh, do a uh, do the diluted solution is that it works a little more slowly so I can see that they're starting to change color and sometimes I even go and use scotch bright in the uh, patina to even things out. These are moving right along so I'm just going to continue on with them. Now it's interesting because this one has been annealed and bent, and everything seems to be moving faster on, on it than this, which was just a piece we used to try out the Duomite bender. And so it's never been heated up, it's just as stock. And these have both been blasted in the blast cabinet, and then I took the maroon scotch bright and went over them uh, to, to even it all out. And with the scotch Bright, one of the things I'm really doing is opening fresh uh, scratches, uh, fresh clean areas onto the metal so that there's reactive surface. Um, so that's the, the big thing. This is, I can feel it, this, uh, it's probably at about 60 degrees or so because that's the temperature that the, the shop has been at. I imagine if this was warmer, it'd be moving a little faster. Uh, I also did find that this wasn't the, uh, as concentrated a batch of the patina as the previous one that I had purchased. So now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna just rinse that off. And there's a certain about amount of modeling that happens with this and I'm kind of wiping over all of it with my fingers. And that evens it out a little bit. And so now we can see with that, we've had a nice color change, but there's a certain amount of unevenness. So at this point, I'll very gently go back over with the scotch braid, And for some reason I find that once I put a, a layer of patina on it and I go and do this to even it out, the second time around actually progresses more quickly. Uh, and you can pretty much do this as many times as you want to uh, get the sort of evenness that you want. So I'm gonna put that one back in and let it start going again. And we've just let this sit in there, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, it accelerated. And it's a much darker finish than originally we had thought. And so, uh, and once this has been rinsed, it pretty well stops. There's some people that like to use a, uh, a baking soda bath to stop it, but I've talked with the people at Sculpt Nouveau and they claim that by going and just rinsing it well with water, that uh, neutralizes the patina. 
Now I'm really happy with how that came out. And I'm not gonna go over that with Scotch-Brite or anything. That is just even. And uh, so that's really nice. Now this, while we've been at it, has been sitting in there. And that's the thing, it's like all of a sudden these, these actually change quite a bit. What always amazes me on this is since these are silver brazed, or this is, uh, I would think that the silver would react differently. But you can see here at the joint, it's pretty darn close in its color. And again, within the, the color palette of a mount like this, that is kind of a gentle enough difference that I don't mind at all. So that has really come out very nicely. I like that a lot. So with these being washed off, these are neutralized, and I would probably then use Renaissance wax to coat that. Um, but even uncoated, I've found that they don't really change over time, and I've never found a, a corrosive nature to it. So the one other I want to show is a patina for steel and this is specifically a gel patina and so this is you paint it on and because of this gel consistency it really holds on very nicely and so this again this piece has been uh, both sandblasted and then gone over with the scotch bright and I do find that you know, a little bit of agitation often really helps. And you can see that blackening very quickly. This one's moving really quite fast. And that's one of the things I like about patina is that it's immersive and you can go and get your color happening very, very quickly. And so start to finish on... Uh, getting the color on that piece of steel was under a minute. And uh, this, you are going to want to coat with something like a Renaissance wax. They say that it won't rust uh, for a period of about a day, but you could start to get a little bit of rust happening. And so they recommend putting a clear coat or uh, Renaissance wax on steel, but I mean, that's a pretty darn nice finish. Uh, so these are finishes that I've used a lot. Uh, we do have to be careful because they are uh, definitely, uh, they have a toxicity. These are selenium acids in general, but they're, you know, they're proprietary. I find the M38 in the dip has very little volatility, so I, there's no fumes. I'm not feeling it and I'm not smelling it. Uh, the PC9, the gel, uh, I also feel is incredibly stable and safe. Some of these others, the Black Magic, I've used this once and it has got warnings all over it and I thought I had plenty of ventilation and I just about choked. I will not be using that. The Black Universal uh, Patina I got, and I don't think I ever used it, but it is, I believe, the, uh, the Universal Patina where they say there's no acids and stuff. These are more surface finishes. Um, so check with Sculpt Nouveau. They have all sorts of different ones. Uh, Jax, J-A-X, is another uh, brand of patinas. They have a really nice pewter uh, color for brass that I used to have. I don't have it right now, but it made a really nice gray silver. And uh, so it can be a very useful setup and it can give a very nice look, uh, you know, especially again with natural history specimens. It's really good. The Alaska State Museum used this sort of patina throughout, and they did a lot of work trying to figure out timing and uh, concentration to get specific colors, and in the end found it still is an art. So uh, get some of this. They don't 
cost all that much and play with them and get to know them. Um, so uh, I look forward to talking with you in the breakout rooms later and we can answer questions. And now we'll move along with the rest of the workshop. Thank you so much.